Tonight on KGW News, a man is hit and killed by a car at an intersection advocates have fought to improve for years. The failure to install them means we don't care about preventing the loss of life that is inevitably going to happen there. Plus, parents fed up. We failed. We absolutely failed these kids. Why their kids could be stuck learning in makeshift classrooms through the end of the year. Then later, why the same local tech that helps keep you warm in the winter is now headed to the moon. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko. And I'm China Green. We begin tonight with frustration over a dangerous intersection in southeast Portland where a man was hit and killed last week. It turns out safety upgrades have been in the works at that very spot for years, though crews still have not broken ground. Our Alma McCarty went to find out why. This is the area of Southeast Woodstock Boulevard near 97th Avenue. Back on February 4th, around 545 in the evening, police say that there was a man trying to cross the street here, but he was hit by a car and killed. PPB's major crash team responded to the Lentz neighborhood soon after. Officers say the driver of the vehicle remained on scene and cooperated with investigators. This week, police identified the pedestrian. 71 year old Thomas Amato. As first reported in Willamette Week, this very spot is up for safety improvements from sidewalk upgrades to enhanced pedestrian crossings, as shown in these PBOT renderings. What you have in this area is a pretty a critical mix of uses that's a deadly recipe. Sarah Ianarone, executive director of the Street Trust, explains there's a lot going on here between nearby I-205 traffic ramps, excessive speeding, bus stops, and foot traffic. So you pair all these various uses with the lack of safe infrastructure for people walking and biking, especially trying to cross these streets where traffic is moving at high speeds. And unfortunately, fatalities like that are hugely predictable. As you know, the city for over six years has promised to make investments here to keep people safe, and they haven't done it. PBOT claims there's a reason for that, and it all comes down to funding. This is what happens when you have a transportation department uh, that is cutting its budget year after year. Spokesperson Dylan Rivera acknowledges the delays, but says they haven't abandoned the project citing 60% completion on design plans. We've been accomplishing a lot of work on this uh, Woodstock project, given limited funding, given uh, changing federal requirements and rules, given the difficulty of a global pandemic, given the difficulty of inflation, which has reduced the purchasing power of this project's budget. PBOT plans to begin construction sometime this year. In Southeast Portland, Alma McCarty, KGW News. Alma, thank you. Let's get you caught up on tonight's other headlines. A former Boy Scouts of America employee has pleaded guilty to sexual abuse of a minor. On February 1st, Malala police say that they found 28-year-old Peter Simpson in a city park after hours with a juvenile in his vehicle. Detectives learned Simpson met the victim through an online chat and the victim was not affiliated with the Boy Scouts. Simpson's sentencing includes 75 days of jail time and five years of supervised probation. The Boy Scouts say they are doing their own investigation as well. Pacific Power customers can see their power bills jump nearly $30 a month starting next year. That is if Oregon's Public Utility Commission approves a 16.9% rate adjustment, which amounts to about $300 million. The company says it needs to raise rates to meet the rising costs of wildfire risk management, including growing insurance premiums and fire mitigation. Now keep in mind, Pacific Power also owes hundreds of millions of dollars in settlements and jury awards in lawsuits related to the 2020 wildfires with several more lawsuits pending. If approved, the increase would go into effect the first of next year. And Nike is laying off approximately 2% of its workforce. According to a letter sent to employees, the first round of layoffs will start as early as Friday and go through next week. This comes after the company announced a major $2 billion cost saving plan back in December. Nike is one of the region's largest employers with more than 15,000 workers in the Portland and Southwest Washington area.
to brewing frustration tonight for some Portland Public Schools families. First, there was the strike and now parents tell us damage from the ice storm has forced some kids to go to class in common areas. As Thomas Schultz explains, the current solution doesn't seem to be so temporary. It feels like the straw that broke the camel's back. For the past like few weeks, learning has been cramped at a couple Portland schools. At Jackson Middle School, common areas are now makeshift classrooms filled with Robert Gray students. There's a lot of distraction. Parents say distractions like classes letting out at different times mean some Jackson students walk through makeshift Robert Gray classes to get to their next period. It's not the outcome that we want. It's, you know, we want our kids to be able to get the education that they deserve. Dan Roberts has a son at Robert Gray Middle School, though for the past few weeks, his son and others have been forced to travel here to Jackson Middle School. Markham Elementary students are going to other schools too after the two PPS schools were heavily damaged in January ice storms. This one has been pretty rough. Kids were supposed to return to their schools in mid-February, though this week PPS announced the schools would be closed for the rest of the school year. Administrators say asbestos in flooring, ceilings and drywall has slowed repairs, leaving students stuck. It's been hard to see these kids have to be the collateral. We failed. We absolutely failed these kids. In letters to parents, Portland Public says they realize the continued closures are incredibly disappointing, and they say they're having conversations about how to best support students. Though to parents, that's not good enough. The fact that there are no trucks here working on gray is super frustrating. Frustrating too, Lacey White says, yeah, that there aren't portable units to set up classrooms. And just another example of students being asked to do more with less. Between the pandemic plus the strike and now this, our kids just keep being asked to be resilient and rise above. That was Thomas Schultz reporting. Portland Public says that they are working to get portable classrooms. The district is also holding a meeting next week to determine other possible solutions for Robert Gray students. We want to take a moment tonight to sincerely apologize to our viewers for airing a deeply offensive photo during this evening's The Good Stuff show. The photo had been submitted to our Facebook page and should have been reviewed prior to being included in the program, which is our normal process. We deeply apologize for this error and for any pain it has caused. In other news tonight from Salem, while lawmakers debate potential changes to Measure 110, including recriminalization, advocacy groups held a rally for more support from the state. The organizers, Oregon Recovers, is asking the legislature for 3,000 more treatment and detox bed and increased access to medication and assisted treatment. As for Measure 110, the group that put on this rally says they are still divided on whether possession of drugs should be recriminalized. And the need for more resources around addiction is easy to see, which brings us to a local community college program designed to fast track training to help keep up with the demand. Though it turns out it's taking a little bit longer time to get up and running than uh, they thought. So the program has been already delayed twice. The college says that staffing issues are to blame partially for this. The department hopes to launch it in the fall if they get approval. Yet the addiction crisis isn't getting any better downtown. We talked with those at Central City Concern. They run most recovery housing programs in the state and often look to Portland Community College for new counselors. I've had really good counselors here at Central City Concern, really good ones, but they come and they go. It is your only freaking lifeline. So you'd think that the college would be prioritizing a program where people's lives are at stake, um, but in essence, they're, they're not. If the program is approved, it hopes to get up and running in the fall of next year. As Portland continues to rebound out of the pandemic, the Metro Chamber, formerly the Portland Business Alliance, released its 2024 State of the Economy. Now, among those key findings, job growth in 2023 was below the U.S. average. Local government jobs are now above pre-pandemic levels, while manufacturing and private sector office jobs saw declines. Now, of the four metro area counties, Multnomah has yet to exceed 2019 job totals, but the gains are enough for the chamber to consider the pandemic recovery to be completed. Another big area of concern, Multnomah County saw a second year of population decline. 
And so as a region, we've always attracted people here. And that's largely been predicated on the fact that we are as affordable or more affordable than other places. And that simply has changed in the last decade to where Portland isn't now on the top of the list of places to move that's most affordable. Well, there is a lot to digest in this report. The chamber's recommendations here moving forward include converting office buildings to housing, increasing downtown foot traffic, working to attract more businesses and retaining and growing current businesses. Straight ahead on KGW News at 11, into the great beyond. How Columbia Sportswear is playing a big part in helping a spacecraft reach the moon. Love that story. Plus, it is game night in Rip City. How the Blazers did in their final matchup before the All-Star break. And no break in the snow up in the Cascades right now. Here's Timberline Lodge. You can see the snowfall in the air. There's been 13 inches of new snow in the last 24 hours. Tomorrow is going to be a really good powder day. I'll have the forecast for the rest of our weekend, but for now, here's the ski report.